I'm ready when you are. All right, go for it, Dave. Today is February 26, 2015, and my name is Jerry Gill, and I'm interviewing uh, Alvin Deer in the Oklahoma Conference Ministry Center in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. This interview will be filed in the archives of the Oklahoma Conference of the United Methodist Church and in the archives of the Oklahoma History Center. It will also be available on the website of the Oklahoma Historical Society. Alvin, tell me a little bit about your tribal affiliation and background. Uh, my father was uh, Muscogee Creek and uh, originally from Alabama and Georgia and came over on Trail of Tears in the 1830s. My mother was, was a Kiowa Indian, uh, which originally were from Canada in Montana, and they wound up on the Southern Plains, uh, probably they said back in the early 1700s, and, uh, and that they're now located in southwest Oklahoma. Can you give me some personal information about your childhood, uh, you know, your parents, where you grew up, some early formative experiences? Uh, well, I was born in the uh, Indian Hospital in Lawton, Oklahoma. It was called Kiowa Indian Hospital at the time. Uh, in 1942, my father went out to California in 1945 after the war, and we followed him out there a year later, and I started uh, school out there. And um, he wound up in the motion picture business uh, from 1947 to his uh, death in 1959. Uh, he was in over 300 motion pictures uh, as an extra and uh, stuntman and whatever he could get extra money for. <laughs> yeah, I understand that you participate in some of those movies as well? Yes, uh, whenever they needed a child uh, actor, I, I was fortunate to be in over 30 pictures. Uh, I know one time I was a stand-in, so I, I got paid, but you wouldn't see me in the movie because I, I worked during rehearsal time. And uh, You also uh, participate in the Indian dance troupe, is that right? Uh, my father was Creek, but, uh, which didn't do the war dance uh, that is popular. and. But uh, it was a Kiowa dance, but he, uh, his uncle had a dance troupe, and my father danced, and then we danced. Back in the late 40s, there were no uh, s ceremonial dances like they had called powwows all over the United States now, in fact. Uh, so there wasn't hardly any of that except back here, maybe, or in uh, North uh, the Northern Plains, but in California, uh, we were put on dance shows uh, at schools, uh, women's clubs. Uh, we were in rodeos, parades. Um, uh, we just did all uh, kinds of events, uh, just uh, performing. The uh, the uh, mission churches, San Juan Capistrano, San uh, all of them, a whole string of them up uh, California, they would have their annual festivals and we were invited to uh, dance at those events. So we, we did a lot of performing in those days as a young person. I mean, let me look back to your, a little bit about your participation in the movies. I guess this was sort of in the 50s and 60s, heydays of the Western film. Can you tell me a little bit about that experience and how that worked? Uh, well, my father uh, was an everyday actor. Uh, when he wasn't working, he got unemployment, but uh, uh, he would get, uh, like you said, it was the heyday of the Western. They probably made 12 Western movies a week, and most of it was done in Southern California. Uh, there were uh, locations just outside of California, uh, outside of Los Angeles, a Thousand Oaks, a place called Vasquez Rock, where you see a lot of these formate, these rocks that these cowboys ride their horses through. Uh, a lot of movies were done there. They did go on location to Arizona uh, a number of times, but um, uh, he just, he got his work as mostly an Indian uh, who would stand in the background of the, of the actors that were 
And in those days, uh, f real Native Americans could not play the chiefs or the primary Indian actor. There's always some white person. Uh, and one of the most ridiculous ones was Chuck Connors, who was uh, blonde and blue-eyed, and he was playing an Apache chief. And uh, But uh, a number of uh, uh, non-Native uh, people played uh, the actors, and the real Indians would be in the background. Or, uh, and how were Native Americans portrayed uh, in, in those movies? Well, uh, we always lost. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, the... Uh, it's funny though, uh, we always lost and they were called savages and this and that, but uh, if you watch the Westerns of 50, there was a sense of um, of kind of um, sympathy for the plight uh, of the Indians. The, the, the uh, not the antagonist, the protagonist, I guess, would was always on the side of the Indians and the antagonist was always trying to do them in. And you see that theme a lot in the movies of the 50s. And uh, 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 like I said, my father passed away in 59, so he was no longer, he, he was scheduled to do a, a movie with um, uh, Burt Lancaster called The Unforgiven, and he passed away before that happened. Uh, and then I uh, uh, quit when I was 14 because I had to join the union at 14, and my grandmother didn't want to, us to join the union. So I, uh, I worked in about two or three movies after that, but it was uh, not like when I was younger. We were in maybe uh, seven or eight, nine uh, a year. That was one of the experiences you had there, I understand, that you, you uh, worked with the Los Angeles Indian Center. Uh, when my uh, my grandmother was a very active um, activist, you might say, and uh, there was a Los Angeles Indian Center. She was on the board. I grew up as a kid playing around, uh, but um, I became a board member when I was 21, and I've been in accounting since I was in my early 20s, and wound up being the treasurer for the uh, Indian Center. And we, we brought in uh, the first federal grants for Native Americans in the Southern California area uh, back in the late 60s when Johnson declared war on poverty. <laughs> and about how were you returned to Oklahoma? I guess, uh, so two questions. How were you returned and, and why at that point did you come back to Oklahoma? Uh, I came back in 1972. I was age 30. Uh, I jokingly say it was a year after the Silmar earthquake, which I was in. It was the most terrifying experience I ever had. And I said it took me a year to get out of there. But the fact is I always wanted to move back to Oklahoma, always, even when I was young. Uh, I just wanted to come back. Uh, this was home, and I, I just, that was my goal in life was to get back. And fortunately, uh, by the time I come back, I had worked uh, for a, a Native program that was developing businesses for trying to help Native people get into business. They had the same program at OU, ca ca uh, a group called the Oklahoma for Indian Opportunity, and I wound up applying for the director and at age 30 became director of the business development program for Oklahomans for Indian Opportunity. So that's how I got home. I got a, actually got a promotion to come home. <laughs> oh, it's good. Yeah. Be running to something. Uh, and what, uh, something else happened in your life during that time. You had a call to the ministry. Can you talk about uh, the, how you got that call and, and where it led you? Well, my Kiowa grandfather was a Methodist minister for over 50 years, and uh, he served in the uh, former Oklahoma Indian Mission, and uh, uh, I don't think, yeah, he did serve in when it became the Oklahoma Missionary Conference. Uh, on my, that was my mother's uh, father. <coughs> my uh, Creek grandmother 
her family also happened to be Methodist, and we, our home church is near Okiba called Arbica, and it was probably built in the 1880s. So it was built before statehood. Uh, one of the things about um, uh, Methodism is that the first churches that were established here were established by Native people uh, because we had become Christian in Alabama and Georgia. And one of the great stories is that some of the uh, Methodist preachers who were non-Indian, who had Indian congregations being uprooted and brought to Oklahoma, we hear that they went on the Trail of Tears with their congregation. And uh, uh, the first church, Methodist church, was Riley Chapel in uh, Tahlequah, Oklahoma in the 1830s. And that's been our, our, our history, uh, my family history, uh, was Methodism and the Trail of Tears. You uh, talked a bit about where you got your college education and in your divinity school education. Uh, I, uh, when I was working for the banking industry in Los Angeles as an accountant, I, I got my two-year degree at Los Angeles City College and came home and here I was director of a program and didn't have my bachelor's yet. And, uh, but I eventually, uh, I was administrator for the Kiowa tribe and uh, a friend of mine worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and said, why don't you go back and get your bachelor's? He says, I'll give you a tuition grant. And I said, okay. So I, I went to USAO and finished my business administration degree. And um, uh, about that same time, I, my life was changing. I was feeling something deeper inside of me. Uh, and um, I never, ever, ever grew up thinking I was going to be a minister. Uh, it, it just started happening, and I, I felt a, I, I made a rededication of my life in 1978. I got my degree in 79, and, and by 81, I was uh, feeling the call to ministry. And um, in the Oklahoma Missionary Conference, uh, because of the uh, this, the discipline allows missionary conferences to set their ministerial standards. Uh, the OIMC uh, had a plan where you could go to course of study and then after that, uh, maybe five years in ministry, t uh, you could become an elder. So I didn't have to really get my divinity degree to, to get my elders' orders. Can you talk a little bit about some of your appointments and experiences within the uh, Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, uh, you know, years and dates you served? Uh, and, and well, I was a candidate in 1982, and um, I, I was a little bit disillusioned with uh, the ministry at, uh, as I began to Looking at uh, who uh, the Canada the the folks that were in it, I I felt I was on fire, and I felt like everybody had to be on fire for the Lord, and uh, I I thought everyone was too casual. Um, Native people in Oklahoma had the highest incidence of alcohol and drug abuse and teen suicide and all of the social ills, and, and I felt like. We needed to be like emergency room surgeons, not uh, uh, pediatric or you know MDs, just seeing people on a weekly basis. We that we were in a, a in a crisis situation with our people, and I just didn't see that urgency. So I pulled out. Uh, but two years later, the missionary conference advertised for a treasurer. And there, there was my by that time, 30 years of accounting background. And I'd take a cut and pay to, if I was to take the job, and I didn't, no, I ain't gonna take that. And the Lord just hounded me to death about it. <laughs> I finally applied and became the treasurer for the conference, and I was treasurer for 11 years. 
and 84 to uh, 95. And um, during that 11 year period, I, I served, uh, also supplied churches. I supplied um, uh, four churches during that 11 uh, year period. And Can you recall some of the challenges and some of the key initiatives and programs of OIMC during your tenure as, as treasurer? Uh, <clears throat> the missionary conference uh, was supported quite a bit by uh, General Board of Global Ministries and uh, GCFNA, and um, and uh, I felt like we needed to change our attitude of being the mission to be in mission. And I felt that if we could uh, change our congregation from thinking like that they were the mission, that, uh, you know, that they're going to help us get this and they're going to help us get that, and, you know, uh, that if we became more uh, independent, uh, that, to me that was the, the essence of Christianity was, um, and and uh, and so that was uh, my goal. I uh, I uh, uh, instituted uh, local church financial responsibility workshops, uh, working with the local treasurer and the congregations on how to uh, properly manage their finances. And um, just uh, I I sought uh, how we might. Uh, reduce our expenses and increase our revenue through different sources, which uh, helped our cash flow quite a bit. Uh, when I took over, we were near uh, bankrupt as far as our cash flow went, and uh, we, we made some major changes and was able to improve our cash flow. In your spare time, as you lived earlier than you. In my spare time, I, I pastor you tell churches. Us some of ministry yeah, my first one was a doozy. They asked me to open up uh, a closed church in Kingfisher, Oklahoma. And uh, that was 1985. And uh, fortunately, I had a minister friend who was from Kingfisher, and she gave me names and addresses of people who lived in the area. So my wife and I would go up there and knock on doors. And um, we had our, when we opened the church, I put it in the newspaper and I had coffee ready and we were ready to welcome all the people coming in. Probably the first month or so, uh, nobody came. So we would have, stay until about 11.45, then we'd have a devotional and then we would close the doors. And, um, uh, two specific times I remember somebody would come by and say, oh, do you have church today? And I said, yeah, we just got through. I said, come next week. And one was a young lady who uh, was drinking. And she said, I'll come back uh, uh, when I'm sober. And I said, no, you, you come next week. I said, you can't change your life. God can change it. And so we took her to the altar and prayed with her and, and said, uh, let God work from the inside out to change your life. I always remember that young lady and that family, and their, that family, I'm still close to them. But that was, uh, you know, one of the challenges. And I, I, I can say that uh, by the time I left there, we probably averaged about uh, 35, which may not be much in general statistical terms, but it was a great accomplishment. We had a youth group of about 15, and we were able to send them six flags and do a lot of things uh, uh, with the community. And, uh, you also work with some Cheyenne churches? Uh, well, the Kingfisher was a Cheyenne church, and uh, uh, Kingfisher was one of the church, was one of the communities that didn't exist on April, whatever, 22nd, 1889. And the next day it was a town because of the land run. And in order to uh, help 
our people, I joined the Ministerial Alliance because they could get access to the clothing bank and to the Salvation Army utility assistance and Alliance members could go to the jails. They didn't want any non-Alliance members because the, their term was they didn't want fly-by-night preachers coming to the jail. So uh, that's why I joined was to help our people. I was the only non-white minister in the Alliance. And so the, that April of the 100th anniversary of the land run, uh, they said, why don't every church do something t that represents the land run? And then they looked at me, and, and of course, by that time, I was friends with the preacher, so I could joke with him. And they all looked at me, and I said, well, I could stand on a piece of ground, and you could come and push me off, you know. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, it, I, I was there doing the 100th anniversary of the land run. It was, it was interesting. You didn't get pushed off any ground, no? I didn't get pushed off, no. Your current uh, appointment is with Billy Hooten? Yeah, I'm retired, but I'm serving the Billy Hooten Memorial here in Oklahoma City. Could you tell me a little bit about that? What's your membership, your average worship attendance, and other... Billy Hooten was a member of the Oklahoma Conference, and somewhere in the 60s, I guess, their uh, membership had gotten elderly, and they were going to close, and I guess they offered it to the Indian Missionary Conference, and uh, it, it thrived for quite a few years. Uh, the, a lot of the original family stayed, and... Uh, uh, so we have a multicultural congregation, and um, our uh, head of the trustees is one of the people that's been in that area for many, many years, and they sing Indian hymns with us, and I mean, you know, they've been culturated for the last 40-something, 50 years maybe, and, uh, but it's uh, in the F Mulligan Flats which uh, uh, I, the whole area is deteriorating and uh, the church is in bad shape and uh, a lot of our members are elderly and we have a lot of uh, uh, sickness among them, uh, MS and cancer and heart uh, trouble. Uh, so it, we're, we're struggling. Uh, probably our uh, membership is around 40 and our average attendance is anywhere between 20 and 24. So it's, it's, a, it's a small congregation. Um, can you expand a little bit about the difference between what uh, I'd characterize as the rural churches and, and then churches in the urban area? How are they different? How are they similar? Well, um, <clears throat> in a native context, um, a lot of the rural churches were built early on. I mean, 80s and 1880s and 1890s, 19, in the early 1900s. And uh, there, uh, we have churches that exist, and their members come have to drive a distance to get there. The concept of a church being the center of a community, I don't think exists in any. Uh, sense a lot. I'll, I'll say it that way. I'm, I'm sure that they're first united of um, Minko uh, is a community church, but uh, a lot of the, uh, you can, just speaking of that, Alfalfa United Methodist probably gets members from outside of Alfalfa because there's only about a half a dozen homes in Alfalfa. And that's a, a Oklahoma Conference Church. And for it to exist, I'm sure the rural uh, families and maybe come from Clinton or someplace to support the church. Well, that's the same in the OIMC as we have. I mentioned my home church of Arbica. It's nine miles west of uh, Okima out in the country. And it's uh, supported by families that predominantly live elsewhere. Uh, there, I know of one family that lives in the area. 
uh, my family's original allotment was just north of Arbica Church, uh, the land that goes up to the North Canadian. There were, uh, uh, when I say allotment, I'm talking about the Dawes uh, Act where the uh, land allotments were given to Indian families instead of having reservations. You have extensive uh, hands-on experiences. We've talked about with the uh, churches in the OIMC conference and pastor Native American churches. Uh, from your unique perspective, Alan, what is your assessment of the current status of the churches in OIMC? Uh, I think uh, we are struggling to be a conference. Um, again, I, I see, in my own personal opinion, too much status quo that uh, we, uh, we come to church and we, uh, we uh, nurture those that are there. Uh, there's not m uh, a lot of outreach. I know that they're trying to establish churches like uh, uh, Oklahoma Conference gave us Wilitka, and I guess they gave us commerce too, so we're trying to establish some uh, sense of um, ministry there. Uh, but a lot of our churches, um, the statistics are that we're a dying conference. Uh, when I became conference treasurer in, in 84, we had 111 churches on the books with a membership of uh, over 10,000. And uh, now there are what they, on the books, and I say on the books because there are some churches that are, they're just barely open. Um, there are probably 84 with a membership in the 6,000s. Um, and uh, the trend is downward. And we had a, we had a, pastors meeting where they said if that trend continues in 15 years we'll have probably on the average of about um, 15 churches left. You can't be a conference of 15 churches. Uh, hopefully uh, the leadership is, is uh, making great fantastic plans to revitalize our conference. If not, we will uh, go the way of uh, uh, Rio Grande, which is no longer in existence, uh, Redbird Missionary Conference, which is no longer in existence, the Alaska Missionary Conference, which is no longer in existence. We will go the way of those conferences. Now, if, if these churches would, as you talk about, uh, cease to exist, what would be the loss of the Oklahoma Conference and the, the general church? Well, one, the unique history of Methodism in Indian country. Um, John Wesley uh, came to Georgia, quote unquote, in his memoirs to save the Indians. And on the boat back to England, he said, but who, oh, who is going to save me? Uh, and he pretty much felt like he was a failure at uh, ministry. I, I was at the um, conference center in Atlanta, Georgia, or outside of Atlanta, and they have a stained glass window of John Wesley meeting with the Creek chief, one of my ancestors. So my people were one of the first people that he had contact with, and we, we became Methodists in Georgia. Uh, and. Uh, so they, we would lose that history. Uh, I think we'd also lose a unique opportunity to um, evangelize a whole new generation of people. Uh, Native people, uh, are, as the last time I checked statistics, still uh, the, are increasing at a higher percentage than the general population. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, if our population is increasing 20 percent a year or something, but uh, we we are a growing race. Back 
uh, as a turnaround from 1920 when the statistics called us the vanishing American and there were only about 120,000 Indians, they said, at that time. Unbelievable. And uh, now there's like four million. And uh, we're still the minority of minorities, but um, it's still our land. <laughs> what do you say to people who ask, uh, why do we need a separate conference for Native American churches? Why not integrate all the United Methodist churches in Oklahoma into one conference? Well, it was Martin Luther King that said uh, the 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in America. And uh, there's, a, uh, there's a lot to that. But uh, uh, we would lose all of the hymns that our ancestors were inspired to create. We don't sing, we do, but we don't just sing Amazing Grace in our language. We don't just sing uh, Sweet Hour Prayer in our language. We have native composed hymns that speak about our struggles, that speak about our faith in our languages. Indigenous tunes, both on the, uh, my father's side, the Creeks, and on my mother's side, the Kiowas, uh, they, they uh, when you, read the translations of those hymns, those were hymns of people who were expressing their faith uh, in, in our language and using indigenous uh, tunes. And, and that would be lost because we probably, you, you probably can't get St. Luke's to maybe sing hallelujah. Maybe they would, I don't know. <laughs> uh, hallelujah is a a very popular uh, Muscogee Creek hymn that's sung in our language. And it says, hallelujah. They're singing hallelujah up there. And it says our, our Christian people are, uh, are going there. Our, our elders are going there. They're singing hallelujah up there. We were singing that on the Trail of Tears. And it was like, um, it was like a song of encouragement keep going because they're singing hallelujah up there. You know, like they're encouraging us to make it to Oklahoma and start that new life. Uh, those are the kind of songs that we would miss. We're going to shift to, to your, some of the uh, responsibilities and some opportunities you've had to serve the general church. Uh, we might talk about, for example, your tenure on the Native American uh, International Caucus. Could you talk a little bit about the purpose of the caucus and some of the issues that you dealt with in the time you were on there? Uh, I served as executive director from uh, 1996 to uh, 2007 when I went on disability. Um, the purpose of the caucus was to uh, bring Native issues to the forefront at General Conference uh, that were important uh, to Native communities as well as uh, Native Christians. The uh, mascot issue was one. We, I, I happened to stand in front of Jacob Field in Cleveland, Ohio in April of 2000 protesting the mascot issue. It just so happened General Conference was there, but we stood with the local natives uh, protesting that. I was invited to speak at the East Ohio Annual Conference uh, that year, which it was reported in the United Methodist News that they were saying, I'll give up being a Methodist before I give up Chief Wahoo. And then they invited me to come into that den of wolves and <laughs> speak about why, uh, uh, you know, uh, where uh, the Chief Wahoo is detrimental to uh, our well-being as people. Can you share a little bit about how that, uh, your presentation, how the meeting went? Uh, actually, it went pretty good because I used the scripture uh, that Jesus said that these things you uh, talking about doing the Jesus talked about doing the things you need to do as a Christian, but he said these things you should also do 
Uh, in other words, uh, it's more than just worshiping God and, and, and it's being compassionate to, uh, being a compassionate world to all people, uh, to be inclusive. Uh, it kind of was well received. I, we were at the conference center that overlooked Lake Erie. It, it was a nice experience and, and I, I got good feedback, so uh, um, it wasn't bad. <laughs> Uh, served as a delegate to the General Conference? Okay. Yes, in 1996. I, uh, when I left uh, OIMC in 95, I uh, became uh, controller, fiscal controller for the Shiner Arapaho tribe. And um, they asked me to uh, serve the El Reno Church. Uh, so every morning when I went to work, in this complex of 240 employees at that time, I felt a spirit of grieving in the hallway. I just felt it. And I'm saying, why are these people grieving? I knew uh, the statistics that the Shiner Repo people had the highest incidence of alcohol, drug abuse, uh, family violence, suicide, uh, young uh, people dying t way too young and of all tribes. In other words, native people in general had the highest statistics, but of our race, the worst of us was the Shinarapos. And, and uh, I witnessed some of, I did a lot of funerals for alcoholics and, and people who had overdosed. And um, and then I found out uh, one of the things they told me was that uh, one of the first things they teach their children is uh, the history of Sand Creek. And uh, so I, I discovered it during that time that Colonel Shivington, who led the attack on the peaceful village uh, at Sand Creek, Black Kettle, uh, was to given an American flag and told to fly that flag over his teepee, and he said, and no one will attack you. And today you hear people say that uh, we have never fired on, an Ameri on the American flag. That's not true. U.S. soldiers fired on the American flag at Sand Creek. Uh, it didn't matter that the American flag was flying. And, um, and I realized that they were grieving uh, generationally. And so as a United Methodist minister, I felt like it was my duty to apologize on behalf of Reverend Shivington for bringing death when he was commissioned to bring life. And so I wrote a resolution to General Conference not knowing even where General Conference was because I'd never been there. And, um, and I wrote it and sent it in December, January of 95-96 uh, and found out that um, we were going to Denver. And the uh, conference center was one block away from where Shivington was buried. Uh, they accepted the resolution uh, I had uh, Cheyenne chief and Arapaho chief come and receive the apology. And um, it made international news. Um, and Oprah Winfrey even invited the Cheyenne Arapaho people to come and talk about Sand Creek and the apology and what it meant to them. And um, eventually it culminated in last November on the steps of the uh, Capitol, the governor of Colorado apologized to the Cheyenne and Arapaho people for Sand Creek. And uh, they received it and, uh, and they, uh, Cheyenne honored a soldier who refused to fire on uh, the village and even I was told, I didn't even know this back in 96, that he helped save some of the, uh, the people. 
And, uh, and so all this was brought out uh, last November. It was the 150th anniversary of Sangpreet. And then I felt honored because the uh, Rappo chief, Gordon Yellowman, uh, they had given the Sand Creek medallions. You know, medallions were pop. President medallions were given to Indians in the 1880s, and they, you see pictures of them wearing these things. Well, they had these medallions, Sand Creek medallions made, and I guess they gave them to dignitaries. And uh, he honored me and uh, he gave me uh, one of the medallions and thank me for what little part I had in it. Um, and that's all I wanted was the people to be healed. I didn't ask for no publicity. I just want the people to be healed. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that'll be true. Hopefully. Yeah, I was. He he called me up and said I got something to give you, and uh, he told me what it was. I, so I'm gonna cherish that medallion. Who give it to you? Uh, Gordon Yellowman is his name. He's uh, a tribal. Uh, the the Cheyennes and Arapaho still maintain their chiefs. Uh, it's hereditary, and he's uh, one of the Arapaho chiefs. I mean, you're you're bringing up a, a, an era that's uh, pretty uh, transformative for the uh, Native American community when you met the church back in the eighties and nineties. Uh, the current repentance and reconciliation movement is is an is outgrowth of that. For example, uh, can you discuss? During the 80s, 90s, and the early 2000s, and the, the organization changes and in initiative within the Methodist Church uh, that provides this for the current repentance and reconciliation movement. Uh, 96, uh, we had that uh, uh, resolution to uh, us repenting, so to speak, uh, uh, asking for forgiveness. And uh, being such a greenhorn uh, for General Conference, uh, I didn't know a lot of how to do this and how to do that. I, I had to learn how to even get the resolution off the consent calendar. That's how green I was. And uh, so that it could be uh, presented on the floor. Uh, I, my goal was also to have a repentance service. Uh, at the general conference, but I would have had to have started that work in '95 and worked with the general conference commission and and done all kinds of things. I I, I never I, I just didn't know how to do that, and so it was left undone. When we went to uh, I was uh, went to 2000 general conference uh, as executive director for NAIC. And at that conference at Cleveland, the, uh, the African Americans had an acts of repentance. That was the first acts of repentance. And it was for, uh, it was for the AME, it was apologizing to the AMEs, I guess, for kicking them out or whatever. And it got the Methodist, uh, uh, African American Methodists who stayed in the church a little bit upset and said, uh, we ought to be celebrating us who stayed. So they, they've, that's when they felt, well, we, they need to continue this idea of repentance. And, um, uh, and I had looked at the 04 uh, General Conference at Pittsburgh, and there was a major massacre uh, near Pittsburgh uh, called the Gutenberg Massacre, where they, um, I, I forget the, there was a German denomination that had a mission there, and they couldn't convert the native people to Christianity. And uh, what happened is they locked them in a church and burned the church down. 
And so I wanted to bring that up at Pittsburgh and uh, wasn't, didn't, uh, wasn't able to do it. And uh, went to Fort Worth in 08, and the immigration issue became a big thing. And I spoke at the immigration rally. I, I mentioned that uh, I told the people, I said, my tribe is the reason you have a fort here in the first place. <laughs> Fort Worth was built to uh, contain the Indian problem in in Texas. Uh, the Kiowas and Comanches were uh, uh, fighting the Texans at that time. Um, and so it kind of, and, and about 08, uh, I think a number of the national native leaders uh, decided that, yes, we should uh, have an act of repentance for native Americans, and so they planned it for 2012 at Orlando, and and I, I I was invited to go to Orlando, but I didn't go, and uh, I I saw the uh, acts of repentance that was done. Um, uh, uh, repenting, uh, there's all when when you repent of your sins, it's a change of of thinking, a change of life, change of things. So does the, do the acts of repentance really bring change? That's a question I, I think uh, uh, people should ask and try and answer. I'd like to explore that a little bit more with you. Uh, what, what, in your perspective, is the intended outcome of the uh, acts of repentance and, re and reconciliation movement? In the Methodist Church or in general? Methodist Church and, and you know, the Native American community as well? Uh, within the Methodist Church, um, uh, just from kind of like an outsider looking in, because uh, by 2012 uh, I had retired and I was on disability from 07 to 212. Um, We're talking about what are the desired outcomes from the and well, uh, I think uh, the Native United Methodists would like uh, uh, action on social issues like uh, the mascot issue. We understand the General Board of Global Ministries that is more or less like the uh, the father of OIMC. I don't know the maybe the favorite uncle. Are, is moving to Atlanta, and uh, we had a resolution passed back in 2000, I think, uh, one of the caucus's resolution that the that general conference will not hold a, an event at any city that has racial mascots where the professional teams have racial mascots. They even turned down Richmond. Virginia because the Richmond Braves were there and we were thinking maybe major league but that was minor league team and so they had to move from uh, Richmond in 2012 to uh, to Orlando because of that resolution. The idea is that uh, we would like to have eliminated uh, the Redskins and the Braves uh, my perspective was they can keep the Redskins, but put the Redskin potato on their helmet instead of uh, Indians. And the Atlanta Braves, uh, I th Braves I, is, doesn't offend me, but the tomahawk chop does. I, I, I can't stand to listen to that. And my perspective was Atlanta was the home of southern slaves, so why can't it be the Atlanta slaves? And all you do is take the B and R off the uniform and replace it with an S and L, and you don't have much change to make, you know? And, uh, but nobody would agree to that, nobody. So why is, uh, why is Braves uh, and, and someone had a perspective, it's because of the uh, conqueror's mentality. They conquered the Native Americans, so we owned them. 
that's different than what they they can't say they conquered the blacks. They already uh, this slave issue is different than the conquest of America. And as someone brought that out as maybe the kind of the insidious um, uh, kind of uh, underlying thought of why they feel it's a it's okay to have uh, uh, Chief Wahoo with the big nose and. Uh, you know, and uh, have the Braves and the Redskins and how they uh, literally uh, make fun of our our uh, culture. And plus, it does have an effect at the local level. Uh, I know of incidences uh, where they call border towns. A border town is a, is a white town that's out next to a reservation. Red Lake, Minnesota, the, uh, the uh, native basketball team and the white local team they were they were uh making fun of the indians at that uh, cholo arizona same thing uh white mountain apache team and the and the cholo uh got into it and how they responded was by making fun of them uh just uh, last month uh, native people from an Indian school near Rapid City went to a hockey game and they poured beer on the uh, students, not adults, but students, and tell them to go back to the reservation and stuff. They, they uh, arrested the main guy on that for uh, disturbing the peace. They identified as two-part process. Well, antagonism uh, is not going to be the answer. We can I, I think if we protest, uh, that brings the issue to the forefront. But the only way you can really get people to change it, is, to me, uh, what the Apostle Paul said. He said, I'm all things to all people, so by all means I can win some. He said, I'm a Jew to the Jew, and I'm a Greek to the Greek. Why? So that he can... Uh, win them. The, the Living Bible says, I try and find common ground so that by all means I can win some to the Lord. And I think that's how we do it, is we uh, seek common ground with people and then somehow or another teach them that uh, all, uh, all mankind is worth something. Uh, what is exacerbating the uh, whole issue now is the uh, uh, Islamophobia. Uh, in America, people are literally wanting to commit genocide against a whole group of people. Still, a Christians want to do that. We just need to kill them all. And uh, whether there and there's no such thing as a peaceful Muslim and all that. I I can put Indians, insert Indians, and in all of this um, mania that's going on today, and that is exactly how, how they felt about our people 100 years ago, or 50 years ago, or last week. Stating the obvious, uh, asking for repentance, uh, then. As soon as that there's something to be, to be repented, to be uh, repented of, uh, I want to cover some areas that I picked up and get your your opinions about the past injustices that that uh, that have occurred over the years, and some still uh, as you've indicated today to the Native American community within the United Methodist Church. Uh, for example, uh, we've discussed attempts to to forcefully assimilate Native Americans into Anglo-European society. Uh, can you cite some actions uh, of the church and its missionary e efforts that have that have led to assimilation and, and created injustices? Um, well, uh, 
The uh, boarding schools of the 1800s and 1900s uh, were Native people were uh, punished for speaking their language. Uh, there is, and I'm, I'm not privy to that, but it came out in the last 20 years that the famous Indian boarding school, Carlisle, where Jim Thorpe went to school and a number of um, well-known Native people came out of there, that there are some uh, graves of children there that were never uh, disclosed. And um, the Catholic Church apologized to the Lakota people for the treatment of the Lakota children in Catholic boarding schools. Going on in Canada now, uh, the Canadian Prime Minister had apologized to the Canadian Indians who call themselves First Nations people and uh, apologized for their residential schools, that's what they call them, uh, for some of the atrocities that were perpetuated on, on, on the children. Um, uh, known rapes um, and actual uh, children dying in some cases because they weren't given medical treatment when they got ill and that kind of thing. Um, uh, I, I did you know, have a, a session of boarding school who went to school in the early 1900s, maybe 30s, 40s, 50s. And they all had talked glowingly about their boarding school experience. Uh, you know, it, it was interesting because these were Choctaws, mostly Oklahoma Indians, um, Haskell, um, you know, some of the boarding schools that still exist in Oklahoma today, uh, Grace Academy and uh, Jones Academy and some of the others. Uh, that are still around at uh, uh, Sequoia Indian School in Tahlequah and Riverside Indian School in Anadarko. Um, they, they talked in, in more better terms about how they were treated. They did say, yeah, we weren't supposed to speak our language, but they didn't talk about how they were beaten for it or anything. But other areas of the country they did, and that was forced assimilation. I think it was the uh, uh, head of the Carlisle Indian School, he said that their goal was to kill the Indian and, oh, kill the Indian and save the man. Uh, so that's their, their way of saving us. Da, the Dawes Act, Henry Dawes was a congressman, but he was also a Presbyterian minister and uh, felt like the um, reservation system uh, was a detriment to them because one, not because we were living in poverty, but because it was a communist, communal type of living, which was against American ideals. They need to each have a 160 acres and a plow and a cow, and they will assimilate into society. But they've They've, they may have given us a plow and a cow, but they did not teach us economics. Uh, how do you market your product? And uh, a lot of the lands that we were given, we leased them out to uh, non-native uh, farmers and got lease money from it instead of being farmers. They gave my Kiowa ancestors these uh, uh, picks and different things, uh, shiny metal, and they made necklaces out of them because they were, so, you know, so shiny. Uh, money uh, in Kiowa is all hongya, and it means uh, metal uh, necklace because uh, that was our use for it, you know. Uh, I mean, you can allude to it a little bit in your comments, but another area of injustice is forced upon the Native American communities was the Wesleyan uh, discipline, if you will, and order and, and structure, uh, as opposed to the uh, Native American more open, uh, more uh, sacred uh, uh, land, uh, uh, different worship forms of spirituality. How, how did that create problems for, for the, uh, the 
Indian. Well, um, I know among the Creek Indians, our ceremonial grounds were uh, sacred. Uh, they talk about the eternal fire. Uh, when they came to Oklahoma, we brought the eternal fire with us, and they established ceremonial grounds, and um, they uh, tried to uh, stop the ceremonial grounds and make them totally Christian. And there was a big battle between Creeks, the Christian Creeks and the non-Christian over, over that. And I always say that our ancestors pulled a fast one on the missionaries because when you look at the uh, Creek Indian churches, a lot of our home churches are with a church in, in the middle and camp houses all the way around where each family owned a camp house. And when they came to church, we, our, our, our camp would host uh, different families to come eat with us. And the way all churches faced east. And in those days, the pot belly stove was right in the middle of the aisle. And the minister sat on the west side. Then they have the elder men on the, uh, the south side in the and the honored women, elder women on the north side, that's the exact uh, makeup of the ceremonial ground. You enter in from the east, the fire's in the middle, the chiefs, the mikos are on the west side, and the elders and are on, uh, sit on this side. So we, 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 re, we replicated our ceremonial grounds and, and, and in our church, uh, and, and but then we would worship uh, uh, a Christian God, but we sang our own hymns, uh, not uh, uh, from the Methodist hymnal. <laughs> discuss a little bit about the, the importance of that in the history of this, uh, of the uh, issues that the Native American Church has and, and grievances? Um, yeah, uh, they did try and assimilate us totally into the American society and that there would be no more tribes. Uh, that didn't last very long, from the 1889 to in the 1930s. In Oklahoma, they uh, created the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act, and then uh, there was a similar act passed for the other tribes, which created tribal governments, because the Supreme Court ruled that based on our treaty rights, we still were a domestic sovereign nations, and that we were sovereign over our lands. And so they created tribal governments uh, in the 1930s and and on up to today, uh, our government uh, status was established uh, in the 19 reestablished in the 1930s, and our people started rebounding as a people because that was the 1930s. Of course, was the uh, Depression era, and uh, and. Uh, in 1921 was when they said we were the vanishing American, that uh, at the rate we were going, there would be no more Native Americans left. Um, some have estimated there were as many as, many as 50 million Natives uh, in both continents. And um, in, a, in continental United States, we were down to 120. They, they deemed that. Uh, there's a book called The American Holocaust that uh, that uh, chronicles that history. To get a little bit of balance, can I maybe close in on, on, on a, perhaps a, a positive note? Sure. Uh, Praise the Lord. In your opinion, <laughs> what have been some, some of the uh, past and continued successes of the Methodist Church in working with Native American communities? Um, well, of course, uh, they, they finally took up the issue of Sand Creek. Um, 
uh, the, the church provided uh, seed monies for them to, uh, for the U.S. government created Sand Creek as a national monument. It was in private hands until just recently. And uh, Cheyennes who wanted to go there and to visit there and that battleground, they had to ask permission of the uh, landowner to go on there. It is now a national monument. There's a, um, there's a, a visitor center there and uh, with a history of Sand Creek and et cetera. Uh, that, that was uh, partly because of the uh, uh, Methodist involvement. Um, I, I, I think uh, uh, Methodists uh, have been active in general in social issues. Uh, and, and we have been beneficiaries of a lot of the activism that, uh, uh, that Methodists have been involved in, whether it's women issues or, or um, right now what's in the forefront, my, my, how, where are we going to go as a church on uh, gay rights? Well, there's Native American gay rights. Uh, I mean, Native American gays, you know, that uh, uh, we kind of accept them. They're called two-spirited people. That's uh, kind of a, uh, a handle that they've been given by Native people. But uh, where are we going to go with that as a church? But we're, we're, we're still continue to be, I think, in forefront over social issues as a church. And we have benefited from it as Native people. Just a couple of final questions. I would respond to this. I've uh, talked to Nita Phillips and other leaders in the church, the Native American community. It's part of, they've said part of the, the uh, acts of repentance and the reconciliation is about, uh, you know, we haven't disappeared. We're here. Here it says, uh, understand the contributions we've made. How, how do you feel about that? Uh, is that important to the Native American community? To the Native American community to be recognized, but it doesn't. It, uh, yeah, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to happen in a in a church context. Uh, by the same token, she says we're here, but we're also saying we're not going to be here very much longer as a church entity unless we make some dramatic changes. And I'm always one for going against the status quo. I, I feel like we can do things better. Uh, we can do church better. Uh, we can be innovative in reaching uh, the lost f with the gospel. Uh, and, uh, you know, however we reach the people is what's important, not necessarily uh, saying, well, if you come to my church on a Sunday morning, I'll preach you a good sermon and you'll get saved. And that's how we do it. No, I think we, we need to find ways to reach the lost. Um, still, you know, I, my wife, I'll end with, my wife used to work at the Oklahoma City Police Department for 38 years. I drove her to work, came back down Chartel, where the city rescue mission is, and I would pass Sheridan Avenue and then and then I would see all these homeless people. A lot of them were native people. And when I passed Sheridan Avenue, what echoed in my mind was General Philip Sheridan's famous quote, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. And then I saw my people on the street and I said, that's not true. And we're going to change that mantra. Um, that the only good Indian is someone who's healthy and and saved and whole. I really appreciate your comments. Let me just conclude by asking you, is there anything we haven't covered that you'd like to speak to or uh, that, that's on your mind that you feel people need to know about? Well, uh, n not really. I think we've covered some of the major concerns uh, of uh, Methodism in Indian country, are we going to be around? Uh, I don't know. I, as fortunate as director of 
the caucus to have visited churches all over America, native churches, and it's the same everywhere. They're, they're struggling. Uh, we're, we're not the center of community on a lot of reservations. Uh, we're barely surviving. How are we, how are we relevant uh, to the community? And uh, how, uh, is anyone out there trying to say, let's, let's try and do things to make us relevant? Or what are we, what are we here for, you know? Um, that that's uh, the struggle is not just in the OIMC, it's it's uh, in all of our native uh, community churches. Okay. Excellent.